Our next speaker is Mrs. Titi Oshodi. Mrs. Titi Oshodi is a distinguished administrative executive and change management leader who currently serves as the special advisor on climate change and the circular economy to the governor of Lagos State. With over two decades of experience in senior management roles across direct sales, marketing, and business development, Titi has honed her project management expertise working in London and Lagos. From spearheading experiential projects in corporate environments to impactful public relations initiatives within the federal government, her exceptional skills were further recognized during her tenure as senior special ad administrator to the governor of Lagos State. Titi studied economics at Olabisi on Obanjo University and has expanded her knowledge through several prestigious courses at the Harvard Kennedy School. Titi holds full membership with the Society for Corporate Ethics and Compliance in the USA and the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management, Nigeria. She is the Deputy Vice Chairman of the Public Policy and Advocacy Committee in the Governing Council of the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management. She actively participates in various board capacities and committees within the public and the private sectors. Mrs. Titi leads a fulfilling life as a mother of two, supported by her loving husband and a strong community of Christian friends and mentors. Please let us welcome to the platform, Mrs. Titi Oshodi. nation, the platform nation. Um, it's such an honor and such a pleasure to be here. This is my very first, even though I'm an ardent um, follower, um, I passionately follow the platform, uh, but I'm one of those virtual um, listeners and viewers. I'd like to seize the opportunity to um, express profound appreciation to Pastor Poju and uh, Pastor Mrs. Oyemade as well. Um, over a decade of the platform, um, saddled with the objectivity of bringing mind, shaping mindset, creating leaders, uh, is no small feat. I really, really am humbled to be here and I thank you so much, Pastor Poju, for giving us the opportunity to come and share and also to be able to experience the realness that I have never felt before in a room. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate you. Uh, and also to the Platform Nation as well, to the Platform Nation. I bring you greetings um, from my boss, the Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babaji de Olushala Sonwolu. Uh, somebody that is very, very passionate, especially about the demographic, the, you know, um, the majority of the demographic that I stand before here today. Um, I know that we're coming and we're representing government, but there's so many things that uh, we're going to be able to share. And this is my reason for standing before you. Mr. Babaji de Olushalasol has said to me, Titi, you make sure that you sell and that you share as much as possible. And that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, honor Mr. Kola Oyenayi that has come before because that was an explosive session and it has set the tone. I think the question is where do we stand? So two varied components that we need to bridge today, this morning, um, democracy and the free market. But I would say, and I'm going to take uh, a different perspective, even though there will be some, form, some influx from what he has expended, there's no way that we can move away from that. And I would say that the interplay between free democracy or free market and democracy um, is settled within the space of sustainability. 
I stand in a, and I, I stand and I operate in an industry that is for sustainability, for sustenance, uh, for longevity. So a lot of what I'm going to be postulating this morning will be from that angle. So I'm defining, um, yeah, I'm defining the interplay between democracy and what does it mean, inclusivity, um, stakeholder management, essentially just making sure, ensuring that there's community engagement. And then we're talking about market dynamics and we're saying, you know, you have democratic processes, uh, the forces between demand and supply that justifies people's preferences. But between both ends, we're saying what makes that sustainability, what makes the standard, what makes it bridge? And that's in how we can sustain the life that we live, how we can uphold you know, the values that are intrinsic for us to be able to live and to be able to progress as a nation. And here I said that sustainability, sustainability is life because if you look at the, um, the interplay, the interrelativity between government, between people, I'm sorry, If we, the interplay between people, between um, the citizens and the businesses, then each component, each entity have a role that they have to play, isn't it? And it essentially means that government, as we have heard, establish regular frameworks, regulatory frameworks. Um, what are the indices by which businesses should be operating? What are the tenets? you know, that help the operationalization of businesses. And businesses in itself, how are they supposed to, you know, push, you know, the, the innovations and technologies and the ideas and the concepts that enable them to be able to run. And the stakeholders are the citizens. They are the ones that are receiving, they're on the receiving end, and they're the ones that are justifying um, the compatibility of the businesses and what is produced for them and how government also enables you know, the, 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 the components that help them to run. So here we are, we say that we want to have a stable economy and all of these trapezoids, you know, indices have to be well in place. But where are we in Lagos? What's our status? And this is a little you know, overview of what is going on with Lagos State. If you look at the numbers, you would notice that a coastal city of a population of over 22 million, as we speak right now, and we have about 65% of that population in termed and classified as highly vulnerable because they are settled in informal places. They're not even recorded within the aggregate numbers of our population, of our data. And if we're talking infrastructure, we're talking assets, we're talking about a worth of 75 billion that is also classified as vulnerable, highly vulnerable. But then again, we also see that there is an issue with the sectors that climate change has impacted. And that's also the bane of our sustainability. Land, which is, you know, where we get our source for food security. And so agriculture is a key aspect. And then tourism, both imbued by land. And if we're not able to start doing something about it, about our posterity, about our longevity, then the cost of inaction as written by the Climate Action Plan, this is a report that has been delivered um, since 2020, 2020 to 2025, says that we're going to be losing an estimated of 22 to 25 billion for inaction, not taking the right decisions or doing something about climate change or about the effect of climate change. If you take a look at the slides, you would see here that I have just numbers. 2,250 tons of waste that will be gener um, um, daily generated. 
that will also generate 60 to 70 megawatts of power of electricity that is worth to power between 60 to 70,000 homes, ability to save over 500,000 tons of carbon emission, and able to create 300 to 500 jobs during construction, and ultimately establish over 100 permanent jobs at the operational facility. That is imminent, and that's something that we're working you know, assiduously towards. We have deals and we have MOUs right about now. Lagos and Ghana has signed a deal to convert our um, uh, landfill uh, from a waste to energy uh, operated uh, facility. And of course, a lot of our markets, Ikorodu right now, has begun to have a properly advanced um, loading, transfer loading um, um, program. So technology is taking a lot more of the space in terms of our operations, and we're earnestly trying to increase our replicate. But these are things that are from our end that we're opening up for business opportunities. We're opening up for, for the corporates, for the private sector to key into. We know also that in all of this, there's a gap in public awareness. There's a gap for us. There's a gap in the polity. Climate literacy is really, really very prevalent and the absence of it is really, really very important. It's really significant for us to be able to achieve um, climate literacy. We want to be able to drive that through every level of PR and media platforms. If we're talking about the creative um, industry, can we start to generate narratives? Can we start to generate messaging? Messaging that will be driven through movies through scripts, through dancing, through music, through the various passion points. Just like, you know, you have, you know, America, the biggest, the, 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 the largest or the most sophisticated country on the land. Can we start to drive that narrative of circular economy? Drive the narrative of what we own as a country, what we're naturally endowed with as our country, opportunities that are inherent in our country. Communication is the engine oil of life, and we must be able to start, and we must start from the bottom up. What are our challenges? Attitudinal change. Like I said again, it's going to be difficult to shift the mind if we don't start to drive incentives. Incentive means money. Money comes from, you know, regulated from, from a large sum. Um, my governor had said it some time ago, and he always says it because he was a bank treasurer for the, for the longest period of time, that there are corporates that have three times the size of the budget of Lagos State. It's time for us to start to infuse and inject capital into our systems, and it will have to start from the corporates. We have an unfriendly finance environment. As had said before, we need to start to you know, increase the level of accessibility to funding, and it sits within our financial institutions. We do, not have, we do not have sufficient data. And we have you know, corporates, we have private sector, we have companies that have the ability, the capacity, the eggheads, the resources to be able to generate data that we can use to drive insights and to inform policies. We need to stop working in silos. If we have companies, if we have MSMEs who are accessible to some information, we need to start to aggregate this data, we need to start to aggregate our workings together so that we can have a holistic form of approach to these businesses, to these issues. And we need to improve the market operations. What are the opportunities? And these are the things that other countries have also you know, been able to do so that they can harness opportunities that are, uh, that are you know, seated, seated within the company, within the uh, organization, the economy. We have tons of opportunities as well on the flip side. Today, I can you know, proudly say that we have food hub, a logistic food hub, logistics hub that has been established along the corridor of um, Ketu and Ekwe. It's, a, it's seated on a 1.2 million square meter. And that facility stores content for up to more than 1,500 trucks and is expected to meet the daily needs of tens of thousands of actors in the, in the food value chain. Within that value chain, there are opportunities for jobs. There are opportunities for playing, delivery, logistics, e-commerce, 
transportation. How can we start to look at those areas and see how much we can proliferate, proliferate that space? So, I can talk about all of the opportunities, you know, but we're just going to go around to what we're looking at. What is our future like? What do we want to achieve? We have investor opportunities. We have job creation opportunities. We have value chains, you know, that we can optimize to the fullest level. In my office, we have programs that are called Leave No One Behind, which is designed for people in incarceration, helping them to be able to have a life out of incarceration within the space of sustainability, educating them on how to be able to convert waste to wealth, educating them on how to be able to use their organic waste, we're, using, we're working with communities right now to develop the sort of model that can help them regenerate wealth into something that is usable, biogas, you know, electricity, um, solar-powered uh, um, um, electricity, right? We have a network, a business network, that is solely designed, and we're beginning to grow in that space. We're having about, about, about 300 right now, and we're beginning to teach them business support, ability to be able to be investable. How do you create a structure that helps you to, you know, stand for a sustainable period of time? How do you incorporate? How do you collaborate? How do you attract funding? How do you attract international partners and technical support? These are little, little things, but ultimately will be replicated across board to be able to help because our desire is to be able to address businesses, address those at the bottom of the pyramid, help them to be able to grow. And the reason why it is comfortable for us is because we see the vision. We see the vision of where we are. We see the vision of what we hold. We see the vision of what we're endowed with. The Global North is looking to our side, to Africa, for the wealth that is required for them to be able to, you know, to be sustained. If we have access and we are blessed with hydro, we are blessed with wind, we are blessed with solar, it's time for us to start to introspectively think about it. It's time for us to start acting upon it. It's time for us to grow our, 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 our um, country's GDP. It's time for us to work. Thank you very much.